Wasn't that an awesome worship time? Let's pray before we get into the word today. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and to come together as a church family and to hear your word. So we thank you, Lord, that this morning, that in this moment, that I thank you, Lord, that your people will hear your words, not my words. I thank you, Lord, that they'll hear your heart being conveyed and your love for them. So we thank you, Lord, for the power and the presence of God to fill every space, every place that they have created for you this morning. So I thank you, Lord, that right now, you're visiting living rooms, that you're visiting people right there on the couch with their coffee in hand. Holy Spirit, have your way in our services today. So we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. And my CC family said, amen, amen, amen. So welcome. This is week two of a sermon series titled, Be Loved, Be Loved. And the main idea for this series is learning how to be loved by God and then learning how to live loved so that we can eventually come to the place where we can show some love to a hurting world all around us. In today's culture, it's, it's an all about you, all about how it makes you feel and how you think and how you act and, and what are your expectations today in being loved. That's my question to you. What are your expectations today in being loved? When you hear the word being loved, what comes to mind? Do you have a certain expectation? And I want to encourage you today as we get into the word Take some notes. If you're a note taker, get a pen, paper, get your device out. But in this series, we're going to be looking at the life of Jesus. And my desire, my prayer as your pastor is simply this, is that we all come to a greater understanding of what it means to learn to be loved by Jesus. So Jesus came to show us how to live life. The Gospel of John is all about Jesus being the creator because Jesus created everything. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and it was the word that everything was created by. So it's more than miracles. John's Gospel records the unfailing love and mercy and grace and faithfulness of Jesus. So let's pick it up in John chapter 1, verse 14. This is out of the New Living Translation. John chapter 1, verse 14, out of the New Living Translation. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So the love of God, the love of Jesus for us is so important, not only for us to learn, but to know, to know. The love of Christ is something that we can never fully exhaust or learn or fully experience. God's love for you and for me, for us as believers, as followers of Jesus, will be an ongoing revelation that we'll experience into eternity. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 6, it shares with us that faith works by love. Faith works. My faith works. Your faith works when you walk in love, but also when you understand and come to a, a, a more mature understanding of how much God loves you. So faith works because you have an understanding of God's love for you. This love is the fuel for your faith. When we understand that Jesus loves us and understand that God loves us, it becomes easier to trust Jesus. Just like the old song says, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. How to love him more and more. So I want to encourage you, let's keep loving Jesus together as a church family more and more. Let's keep trusting him more and more. John chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. This is out of the New Living Translation. And he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well, and it was about noontime. See, several translations say that he had to go, but there were actually three different paths or ways um, that Jesus could have gone. But today, this was the way that he had to go. What happened was this particular area was populated by the Jews and other people groups. So these particular Jews married people from Assyria, creating a mixed group of people called the Samaritans. 
So the pure Jews and the Samaritan Jews didn't get along very well because the Jews felt the Samaritans betrayed their people and their culture. So people avoided traveling this road because of the situation. So Jesus is hot and he's tired from traveling. So he heads to the well. Let's pick up at verse 7 through 9. Out of the same chapter, New Living Translation. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Verse 9, the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Let's take a break here. Most of us, when we were growing up, we were all taught to not talk to strangers, right? Stranger, danger, don't talk to strangers. There's actually a little bit more than that going on here. This woman was drawing water from the well during the hottest part of the day. Why? Because nobody else would be there because most of the ladies drew water later in the day, in the cool part of the day. So she, she must have been embarrassed and, and avoiding people. Maybe she was ashamed of her lifestyle. She is getting water because she is dry, she is parched, and she is very, very thirsty. She wasn't just thirsty naturally. She was thirsty desiring to be loved. She just wanted to be loved. So Jesus is sitting by this well waiting for the woman because he had to go this way. So here's the setup. Jesus' request for a drink of water was strange on several levels. Let me break it down. Number one was the gender difference. In that culture, men usually didn't initiate a conversation with a woman that they, with a woman that they did not know. Number one, gender difference. In that culture, Men didn't usually initiate a conversation with a woman they did not know. Later in this story, Jesus' disciples come back and they see him talking to this woman and they were surprised to find him talking with her. The second point was the religious difference. As the woman observes herself in verse 9, Jews considered Samaritans to be unclean or half-bred Jews who refused to worship in the temple at Jerusalem. Instead, they developed their own form of hybrid religion. And I'm going to save all the details on that for you. But they had even built a temple on the slopes of a nearby mountain to the south so they wouldn't have to travel to Jerusalem because there was so much conflict. So to use a Samaritan's vessel for water would have been considered by strict Jews to make them unclean would have made them unclean. So Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So you kind of get a little bit more of the picture and the scope that's going on here. Nevertheless, Jesus asked this Samaritan woman for a drink. And though she doesn't refuse, she's wondering why. Like, how many of you thinkers you have conversations inside your head? I know a couple of people like that in my life is that sometimes you can just see that, hey, they're having an internal conversation. They're thinking things out loud. So there's expressions on their face. I wonder if the Samaritan woman has some expressions on her face as she's drawing the water. Like, here she is. She's probably thinking, like, like why are you asking me for a drink? And, 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 and why? Why is this happening to me? So, nevertheless, Jesus asked her for a drink. She doesn't refuse. She's wondering why he would go against the social norms of culture to ask her for a drink. The exchange between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, I find is so interesting. Let's pick up at verses 10 through 12 out of the New Living Translation. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift of God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, you've got nothing to draw with and that well is so very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who actually gave us this well and drank from it himself as also did his sons in livestock? So Jesus 
quickly shares with her, if you only knew who you were speaking to, if you only knew who you were talking with and the gift that is so readily available to you, you would ask me to give you living water. See, as we said before in week one, and if you haven't seen that, I want to encourage you, go back to YouTube and find beloved week one. But his introduction was her invitation to no longer be thirsty. Jesus' introduction was her invitation to no longer be thirsty. Living water. It's an invitation to be filled, to be, to be satisfied. And to satisfy that longing where? Way down deep on the inside. But it was hard for this woman to understand. You know, she's looking all around. You don't have a watering pot or a bucket or anything to draw water with. And this well is so deep. And by the way, are you saying that you're greater than my father, Jacob? He's the one who gave us this well. He used it himself and for his family and for his livestock. And then we pick up the rest of the story here in verses 13 through 18. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Verse 15, the woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. See, what's happening here, the woman was focusing on the wrong thing. She thought that if she could only get some of this living water that Jesus was talking about, that it would make her life just all so much easier because she wouldn't have to come here anymore during the hottest part of the day to avoid being gossiped about or, or, or to, to, to carry the burden of the workload of carrying her water pots during that time. Now let's pick up at verse 16 through 18. Jesus told her, go, go. Call your husband and come on back. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man that you have right now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Can we pause for a minute? Ever wonder why Jesus went there? You know, there. Like, why? Like, was he trying to judge her or make her feel bad? Like, that prophetic gift was operating on the inside? Go get your husband. He knew it was a setup. It was a setup. Go get your husband. And, and she's like, I have no husband. And he's like, that's right. You've been, with five, you've been in five relationships recently. And the your relationship that you're in right now, that's not your husband either. So he's, he's trying to, to change her thinking. He's trying to, to shift her thinking. And no, he wanted to change her focus. She was thinking about H2O. But what Jesus was offering was eternal life, new life, no longer being thirsty, trying to feel loved or be loved. Is that he was, he was giving her the love that she was desperately seeking. This lady had been searching her entire life to be loved I and mean, to fill a void, to meet her greatest need. See, we all have that same need, that need to be loved unconditionally. And we try so many other things in life to try to fill the void, just like this woman did. Some tried drugs and alcohol. Other people try different relationships and whatever else, entertainment and whatever you can do, partying, just to make yourself feel better, to feel noticed, to feel loved. So I, I don't know what her family like was like. I don't know what her background was, but I knew, do know this. She was searching for something real and authentic. She just wanted to be loved. So she tried to do what many of us tried to do, filling everything, the void, the relationships, the partying. But Jesus changed her focus by speaking life to her. Can I get a better amen in the comment section, somebody? Jesus reads her mail, and as he does, he isn't judging her. He isn't pointing a finger at her, probably feeling a little awkward, a little uncertain, a little uncomfortable. Let's pick up. It's verse 19. <clears throat> verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> I can see that you're a prophet. Verse 20, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. 
See, in this verse, the woman is really asking, where can I find God? I perceive that you're a prophet since you knew about my relationship status. In other words, it's complicated. It's complicated, right? So in this verse, she's asking, where can I find God? Where is he? Some people say he's over here. Others say he's over here. Where do we worship him? Where can I find God? And let's pick up at verse 23. He said, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So what does it mean to, true, to be a true worshiper? What does it mean to be a true worshiper? It means to worship God not out of obligation, not because I have to, but because I get to. Not out of obligation or duty, but to worship God freely in spirit and in truth because he's been so good to you. He saved your soul from a fiery hell. He's been Jehovah Jireh, your provider, Jehovah Rapha, your healer, your deliverer, your victory, your peace when you shouldn't have have peace. He's been your protection. Worship is not limited to a specific place, but worship God in truth. Worship God with an understanding that Jesus is God and with an understanding that Jesus loves you. It's more than just a song. Let's pick up verses 25 through 28. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. He'll settle the issue is what she's saying. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. And this is happening. That As this is happening, this is when the disciples return and actually see Jesus in this conversation with the Samaritan woman. They were shocked, but none of them had the guts to ask him about it. And we pick up at verse 28. The woman left her water pot behind and ran into town to tell everyone about how she encountered Jesus. So let's pause there for a minute. This is absolutely amazing. The woman came to draw water from the well because she had a need. She was thirsty. She had a need. She needed the water. Jesus didn't judge her. She encountered Jesus. Come on, somebody. And she experienced what it was like to be truly loved. Someone at home right now, someone at the drive through at Starbucks right now, you need to have a greater understanding of what it means to truly be loved. And Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart saying, let me in. Let me heal the wounds of the past. Let me heal those scars on the inside of you. Let me make it all brand new. I know you've been hurt and you might have a relationship with Jesus already, but you're stuck. You're stuck in the hurt. You're stuck in the pain of the past. And today, God wants to move you forward. He wants you to understand that I love you and I've got a great plan for your life. Just release the hurt to me. So this woman, she encountered Jesus and she experienced what it was like to be truly loved. This is amazing. She received what from Jesus. She received from Jesus what she had been trying to find through relationship after relationship after relationship, year after year after year. Maybe there are some, maybe you joined us today, you're seeking and you're trying different things and you're trying to discover or maybe even rediscover who you are. You're seeking fulfillment, happiness, purpose, and have tried different things to try to fill the void. Let's get to the heart of the matter if we could. The woman at the well was looking to fill up her water pot. Instead, as she encountered Jesus, she came in contact with the living water. She came in contact with real love. She believed in Jesus and received him as Lord that day. She left with a fresh perspective. She left refreshed. The dark cloud that was all around her was lifted. She was no longer fearful of what people might think and what her relationship status might be. Because that was the thing. She went out during the hottest part of the day to avoid the other ladies talking trash about her concerning which guy she was with at that moment. So here's the thing. She's no longer fearful of that. She's no longer thinking about that because she came in contact with Jesus who truly loves her. Because Jesus changed everything. She was so thrilled about her encounter with love, with true love, 
that she had to immediately go and tell everyone. See, every other relationship, she didn't go immediately tell everyone with the, with the previous five guys that she was with. No, no, no. But with this relationship, when she encountered and experienced true love, she said, I got to go tell everyone that I know. She wasn't afraid to go out in public. She wasn't afraid to be out at noon or out at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 6 o'clock like some of the other people were. And I got to tell you about Jesus. I have to tell everyone I know about what Jesus did for me. So she left her water pot behind. She left her water pot behind. She left her burden Check this out. Somebody at home needs to hear this. She left her burden with Jesus. Some of you need to leave your burden, the weight, the weight of what you're carrying with Jesus. We're not meant to carry the weight any longer. She came empty and thirsty, but she left refreshed and filled, and I'm so thankful for that. She left truly being loved. Today, I want to give you an invitation to be truly loved, to be loved, to be loved by Jesus. See, I, I, I believe that we are all born with a desire to be loved, for a deep relationship with the Creator, with Jesus, with God, our Heavenly Father. And I want to tell you this is that I want to give you an invitation right now to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus because He loves you so much. See, God loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to live 33 sinless years on this earth. He was despised and he was rejected by man, by religious leaders, and he was brought before the courts. He was beaten, he was bruised, and then he died on a cross to pay the price so that you and me could have right relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, so we can have a relationship with God, so we can truly experience God's love here on this earth but there's going to come a moment when we breathe our last on this earth. And when we, because we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior and has, have received his love, that's what allows us entrance into heaven. I have to be honest with you, friends. I have to tell you the truth right now. There's a myth. There's a lie out there that simply says this. Oh, I'm a good person. I haven't done that many bad things. I'm a good person and good people go to heaven. That's a lie. I need to tell you the truth. Good people do not go to heaven, but forgiven people do. See, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, he was the spotless lamb. He died and took our place and shed his blood to forgive us and cleanse us of our sin. Past, present, and future. He paid the price so that we can have a right relationship, a healthy relationship with God and we can be loved and receive his love. So I want to encourage you, if that's you today, in this moment, don't, don't put it off any longer. Don't put it off any longer. You're not promised another minute. You're not promised tomorrow. Some people put it off, oh, I'll put it off another day. I recently had a friend last week, last week, perfectly healthy, 49 years old, and suddenly passed away. A close family friend grieves our hearts. We're not promised tomorrow. I want to encourage you, if you have never asked Jesus and invited him in to be your Lord and Savior and to re receive the love that you're so desperately seeking, would you pray or pray with me right now? Let's pray together. Repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross just for me. I ask you to come into my heart to forgive me of my sin, to be my Lord and Savior. I confess you as Lord. I confess you as Savior, as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's you. We celebrate you. Come on now. Come on, CC family, in the comment section. Let's celebrate now with those who just made a decision to receive Jesus. We are so thrilled. We want to give you just a couple next steps if we could. Number one is the first thing is tell somebody. Tell someone that you received Jesus today. On the screen, there's a form you can fill out. Just let us know your name and, what, and how we can be a blessing to you. Fill out that form. You say, I received Jesus today and I want to encourage you. If you don't have a Bible, our church family would love to buy you a Bible. If you have a device, you can download the Bible app. And it's just a couple of simple things. 
Is that in the Bible? I'd, I'd pick a translation. There's several translations. The New Living Translation is a good one. So the Bible is broken up into two sections, Old Testament and New Testament. I'd say go to the New Testament, and it's the fourth book in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's the Gospel of John. So I would encourage you to start reading just a little bit every day in the Gospel of John. It really has a great understanding. It gives us a great picture of how much God truly loves us, how much God loves you. I want to encourage you, if you don't have a church family, welcome to Christ Chapel. We want to say welcome to our church family. We'd love to get to know you. We meet in person at 607 Avalon Road on Sunday evenings at 5 p.m. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, we have a service that usually lasts about an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. So we want to encourage you to come on out, join us live in one of our services. We'd love to shake your hand, love to answer any questions you might have, and, uh, and just love on you. At this time, for those who call Christ Chapel home, we want to give you an opportunity to sell your tithes and your offerings. I just want to say thank you for your continued faithfulness in giving. Right now on the screen, there are several ways to give. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, at times we're still feeding people. We're still doing that and being a blessing to our community. But thank you for partnering with us as we plant a brand new local church in this community, a spirit-filled church. Know this is that we're making a difference and that lives are being changed. We're hearing testimonies on a continual basis of how God is changing lives because of Christ Chapel. So it's because of your giving, your faithfulness, your obedience to God in tithes and offerings that that's why we're able to be a blessing to our community and hear the stories of lives being changed. And we look forward to sharing some of those stories with you real soon. But thank you. We're believing God for increase for you and your family, for jobs and for better jobs, for increase in your businesses and for strategies and for just for increase to come. So let's pray. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for every tither, every giver. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you as they're faithful to obey what you say concerning tithe and offerings. I thank you, Lord, that you would just open up the windows of heaven. We declare each one is blessed and highly favored. I thank you, Lord, for every business owner. I thank you, Lord, for increase in their business. I thank you, Lord, for, for those that are seeking you for jobs or better opportunities. I thank you, Lord, for doors of opportunity being open right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for increase. I thank you, Lord, for divine connections and contacts. I thank you, Lord, that just like Abraham, that you would make their name great in the community, in their business, in their circles of influence. And we thank you, Lord, for increase. We thank you that you would prosper them and they would be in health even as their soul prospers. So we thank you for it, Father. We thank you for increase. I thank you for blessing this church in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Hey, we look forward to seeing you here tonight. 607 Avalon Road at 5 p.m. for our in-person live gathering. It's going to be a great time, and it's going to be an awesome time. We look forward to seeing you real soon. God bless you guys. Have a great week.